Hi, and welcome to another episode of Emerald Isle Vacation Home Specialist. I am your host, Dennis Richkowski. Some of you recognize me as the co-owner of Flip Flops Donuts, and some of you know me as your broker of real estate who specializes in waterfront and waterview properties along the Crystal Coast, especially on Bogue Banks and in my town of Emerald Isle, North Carolina. On this channel, you will find essential information from the inside scoops on buying and selling houses to how to live with the ocean, rivers, and sounds that define the Crystal Coast. Today's episode is all about how offshore wind farms are coming to the Outer Banks. Whether you visit here occasionally or live here full time, learning how offshore wind energy could generate high paying jobs, boost the local economy, and improve the quality of life for residents and vacationers alike along the Crystal Coast is a story worth telling. Before I begin, please subscribe to my video channel now or at the end of this episode. Now, a few short years ago, for me or anyone to say that offshore wind farms are coming to the Outer Banks would have been unfathomable. Pardon the pun. After all, there's a chicken little, a Luddite, someone opposed to new technology in every crowd. Oh, wind farms are ugly. They kill birds. The utilities won't connect wind farms to their power grids. Yada, yada, yada. To be sure, wind farms undoubtedly alter the landscape especially with turbines reaching lengths up to 800 feet and blades exceeding 250 feet. In good weather, these gray structures are certainly visible. But, and it is a very big but, other methods of power generation significantly alter the landscape too. Coal mines swallow up entire towns and destroy forests. Ever fly at low altitude over the state of West Virginia? High voltage transmission lines crisscross landscapes and smoke and steam from towering power plant chimneys and cooling stacks can spread miles into the sky, even obscuring the sun at times. Birds face a host of threats. Habitat loss, predation by outdoor cats, collisions with windows, pesticide poisonings. The list goes on. Cumulatively, the losses are huge. There are 2.9 billion fewer birds in the United States and Canada than in 1970 a nearly 30% decline in the total population. Then there's climate change. Now, we can't very easily protect birds from predatory cats, windows, or pesticides. But with wind farms, we can begin to protect birds from the impacts of climate change. And while utility companies resisted purchasing electricity generated by wind farms early on, these power giants are now leaders in harnessing the wind. After all, it's not like Duke Energy needs a reminder that it is in the energy business. It's in the name. It's one thing to disabuse common citizens and corporations of the idea that wind farms are bad for the view, bad for the birds, and bad for the utilities. It's quite another to disabuse politicians. But that is exactly what has happened in North Carolina. Indeed, North Carolina is betting big on on and offshore wind farms to help meet its aggressive goal to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 70% by 2030, a deadline that's only seven years down the road. North Carolina, the first state to bring a wind farm online in the South, wants wind farms to generate enough energy 
to power roughly 800,000 homes by 2030. By 2050, the state wants wind farms to generate 8 gigawatts of energy, enough energy to power the projected 2.3 million homes in eastern North Carolina by that date. We're talking about a lot of wind. And where is that lot of wind going to come from? Well, a good answer is the mountains. A better answer is offshore. And that is why North Carolina is planning for two wind farms to be located in the waters off North Carolina's Outer Banks. The first is the Kitty Hawk offshore farm, a triangular oceanic area located some 27 miles east of Kitty Hawk as the crow flies. For the uninitiated, standing on the water's edge, the horizon is roughly three miles away. So the farm is way beyond the horizon of a six foot individual, making the farm invisible to residents and vacationers alike. And the farm is beyond the range of the Atlantic Flyway, a major north-south route for migratory birds in North America. In 2017, Avangrid Renewables, the same company that operates the Amazon wind farm in Northeast North Carolina, won the bid to develop the 122,000 acre offshore wind project. And in May of this year, 2022, Total Energies and Duke Energy, yes, that Duke Energy, bid $315 million or $2,864 per acre to develop a 110,000 acre offshore wind project some 20 miles south of Bald Head Island. When fully operational, the two farms are projected to generate at least 1.3 gigawatts of offshore wind energy, enough to power nearly 500,000 homes. At this point, you might be asking, where does the Crystal Coast fit in all of this offshore farm business? Good question. Well, the parts involved in an offshore wind farm are massive. Turbines are 800 feet in length, and a blade can clock in at more than 300 feet in length. That's the length of a football field, by the way. And the only way such massive pieces can be transported is by water. And this requires that these massive turbines and their blades be manufactured and or staged at a deep water port. Now, North Carolina has two deep water ports, one in Wilmington and the other in nearby Moorhead City. Both are fully subscribed. However, there is a man-made island located just outside Moorhead City that is ideal for this type of project. Named for a distinctly 20th century technology, Radio Island could soon be a manufacturing and or staging site for parts destined for North Carolina's 21st century offshore wind farms. The property is publicly owned, and it has a natural 45-foot deep water channel with direct access to the ocean. The island has rail and highway connections with the mainland and Moorhead City water and sewer facilities. The zoning is in place, and the acreage is available to build a 200,000 square foot manufacturing plant as well as a 100,000 square foot warehouse. An existing pier could be modified to accommodate the roll-on 
roll-off method of shipping required for loading and unloading massive turbines and their blades. There's even enough undeveloped land to use as a lay-down area for all of this massive equipment. The opportunity to repurpose Radio Island as a staging or fabrication port for wind farms off the coast of North Carolina is a win for North Carolina in general and for Moorhead City, the Crystal Coast, and Carteret County specifically. Another win for North Carolina is the support North Carolinian voters have for alternatives to carbon-based energy sources. The majority of voters polled, about 70%, envision wind farms developing more good jobs, fostering a stronger economy, bringing cleaner air, and limiting or even reversing the harmful effects carbon-based fuels have had on the climate. All of this kumbaya sounds great, but when the proverbial rubber meets the road, where does the money come from? Well, a third win for North Carolina is that the General Assembly has not been shy supporting deep water port projects. State leaders also have not been shy in offering financial sweeteners to foster public-private partnerships or lure a manufacturer to this state. Bottom line, wind farms, whether they are on or offshore, are a win-win-win, not only for North Carolina and its current voters, but also for those voters' children and their children's children. To keep up with the progress in these offshore wind farms, subscribe to my newsletter by, sending, by texting your email address to 919-308-2292 or sign up for my blog on my website, www.eihomesforsale.com and please subscribe to Emerald Isle Vacation Home Specialists on YouTube at the end of this video. Stay well and stay safe. So come on down. Please subscribe to my channel below and definitely return next week to this same bat channel at the same bat time of 9 a.m. on Thursday for another episode of Emerald Isle Vacation Home Specialist.